kind of finds lead to what's called barment. And I think I'll take a second to, to define that. We, we actually uh, settled those certain cases without going through any kind of hearing process, which is available to respondents, but then they tend not to use it because they don't have much of a chance of winning because our cases are so strong the ones we decide to take forward. So we work with the respondent or and or his or her attorney to negotiate a negotiated settlement. And that can be uh, of the kind that involves uh, debarment or something lesser than debarment. Debarment in the United States means that your uh, in the ORI's findings are always designed to protect public uh, public funds, taxpayer dollars. So they're always forward looking. They're not they're not punitive. They're not we don't we don't put people in jail or or take away their money. We, we protect taxpayer dollars by ensuring that they're unable to spend them. Or if they do spend them, they do it under supervision. So a lesser uh, penalty would be they have to be supervised for, say, three years. Everything they, uh, they, write, uh, they write in a grant application or in a, or in a, or in a manuscript or an abstract or even maybe in a lab presentation is reviewed by senior scientists at the institution to make sure that the data that that's reported is correctly reported. So that's lesser significant. It's still a finding this kind of to publish, but it allows people to continue with their career because they still can be supported by, by public health service funds and just need to be supervised. The department is more stringent, more severe, because it means that for, let's say, an average of three years, sometimes much more, uh, they cannot apply for or be uh, supported by any federal research funds. Uh, not just NIH grants, but anything they can, they can apply for contracts with the U.S. federal government. Uh, if they're a physician, they can't receive Medicare or Medicaid reimbursement. So it's quite, quite more, so a bit more serious for physicians. Uh, and just a breakdown of the uh, kinds of uh, these, the uh, professional level of respondents, ranging from department chairs to technicians. Uh, there's a slight uh, uh, increase probability of uh, students and uh, assistant professors uh, being charged with misconduct, but uh, we still make findings at all levels of academic rank. It's a little more difficult to uh, make findings in this country against a full professor who is receiving $10 million a year in NIH grants because the institution finds all sorts of ways to make sure that Claims that he had been able to treat mice such that he could put a 
a skin patch from a black mouse onto a white mouse and it would, uh, it would attach and grow successfully. And normally, as you probably know, most of you know for sure, that that uh, skin graft would be violently rejected because of the act of the innate immune system uh, destroying the foreign tissue within days. And so he claimed that he had found a way to avoid that destruction. And so Dr. Good found that, that you know, everyone said this is true, it's very exciting. Well, he hadn't really succeeded, so he took his mouse and he said, what am I going to do? In the elevator, he took up a black patch of marker and painted a black spot on the mouse and claimed that this was a, a successful experiment. Well, they were going to leave him for a couple of days until uh, the animal, one animal caretaker took the, the, the mouse and noticed that the, the hair looked like some of it wasn't all black, which is suspicious. And he took some alcohol and wiped off the black and found out it was not real. So uh, he got in a lot of trouble and got fired. And uh, if, um, while he, there was other research, they found no problems. So at the time, in the, the mid-70s, the term painting the mouse became as famous, became famous as a, a, a synonym for research fraud. And then there was John Darcy at Harvard, who, who started off at Emory University in the, uh, in the late uh, 1970s, a very, very productive, uh, well-liked scientist in uh, cardiac physiology. And he then went to Harvard with Eugene Brunwald, who was very famous, uh, who thought he walked on water. He thought this Darcy was the, the most talented and productive fellow he'd ever had, and he had well over a hundred by that time, he was very, very senior. And at the time, he'd been there about two years, another scientist in the laboratory noticed, suspected some problems with some of his data. And it took uh, several investigations, two investigations at Harvard, before they actually found that there was a problem. And at the time they did the investigation, they said, there's only a problem in one paper, everything else is okay, we looked at the data. Well, they kept on, the people that are, there are a couple of people that I used to didn't believe that, and they, they, they spotted problems with the papers, and I did an investigation, and they found much greater amount of misconduct, and they also uh, were very unhappy with Harvard at the time, because they said Harvard hadn't done an adequate job of looking at his other work. And as the years, the next few years went on, it turns out he treated, he basically cheated, falsified everything he'd done at Emory earlier, and also even on the undergraduate at Notre Dame University. The scope of his misconduct was absolutely astounding, and uh, it ultimately led to a total of 17 rejected papers. The Stephen Brunning case was a third case, which was actually probably the most serious because it involved uh, treatment of, of uh, mentally retarded children with drugs. Uh, Dr. Brunning was a psychologist at the University of Pittsburgh, and uh, Dr. S S uh, Sprague uh, was an older colleague who suspected that he had been misrepresenting the results of these drug tests on these mentally retarded children who were in uh, institutions. And the results that Dr. Burning claimed to have obtained started to be used as the regular standard treatment for uh, depressed uh, mentally retarded children from around the country. Well, it turns out that this data was completely false, but it took, a, it took about three or four years of multiple investigations by Harvard and NIH to finally get Dr. Burning to admit to, uh, uh, to misconduct. And that was so serious because it involved uh, human subjects that he was charged with a crime uh, and pled guilty to that crime and was given two years of probation. He couldn't well have gone to jail. He didn't go quite go to jail, but he was, he was, he was barred from uh, research. And then, uh, to make it worse, the complainant, Dr. Sprague, was actually treated quite badly, even though he was correct. The first time he applied for a grant application at NIH, after uh, Burning had confessed to, to the misconduct, 
he was turned out. He'd been a long-term grant holder at NIH, and they turned him down. Why? Because good old boys don't tell on each other. And so uh, he appealed to NIH, and higher authorities at NIH actually took a look at the case, apologized, and restored his funding. So he ended up okay, but not every complaint does. So because of these early cases that uh, involved a lot of problems uh, as perceived by congressmen and the U.S. Congress, such as inadequate investigations, poor treatment of complainants by Dr. Sprague, uh, we had a series of uh, hearings and, uh, from uh, uh, basically the ones that are most well known were carried out in 1981 and 1988. The one in 1988 involved the Amishi Kari case, or the Baltimore case, as it's sometimes called, and, was done, and were held by Dr. Uh, sorry, Representative John Dingle of Michigan. Earlier ones were held by uh, a representative from New York and, and one from Tennessee named Al, Al Gore. So, uh, because of the congressional pressure, NIH created an NIH with the, uh, the, at the direction of the Department of Health and Human Services. Which, uh, which, uh, of which ORI and I is a part, created the Office of Scientific of Science and Integrity in 1989. Because of potential conflicts of interest when OSI was investigating intramural scientists in NIH, uh, the department decided to move OSI out of the NIH in 1992 and combine it with another office that had been started at the same time into uh, the two divisions of, of ORI that exist to this day. So our two, two divisions uh, in, are involved with the uh, Division of Investigative Oversight, which I headed for about uh, seven and a half years. Uh, it assists the institutions in, in how they handle allegations and their investigations. When uh, they have completed their process and, we, and ORI receives their reports, uh, ORI conducts a separate and independent review of that, all the data, and conducts uh, its own interviews, uh, often can make additional findings, and, and makes separate findings. I've already sort of alluded to why we do that. Institutions' goals on research misconduct are to uh, take appropriate disciplinary action against the respondent, to correct the scientific literature, and to restore the reputation of, of their institution. ORI's goal is somewhat different. We still want to correct the literature, but we also want to prevent that scientist from leaving the institution quietly, which is what happened before ORI, where no one was publicizing findings, and the, and the, the responsible scientist would simply go to another place and start falsifying the data there. So now they can't do that because of our findings are publicized. And our findings also are designed to uh, look in the forward direction, not backwards, not recover funds so much, but to prevent funds from being misspent in the future. The Division of Education and Integrity has additional uh, other sets of, of responsibility, primarily to promote prevention of misconduct. To do that in a variety of ways, including uh, promoting responsible conduct of research, training, and teaching around the country. NIH, uh, for quite a few years now, has required all recipients of training grants, not other grants, but training grants for young investigators, that all such investigators will go through uh, some sort of formal RCR training. And uh, the idea is to help them understand some of the do's and don'ts of how to do research correctly without making uh, fatal mistakes. They also uh, 